Imagine, demand and build a world transformed. Hello, and we're going to start now. This, welcome to TWT 2020 and to this talk titled As Bold as We Need to Be, Left Utopianism and Its Future. My name is Will Strong and I've got the pleasure to be moderating tonight's session. I'm the Director of Research at Autonomy. I hope you've shaken off your hangovers and are ready for some hope. That's the, that's the message of tonight's session, really. So before I introduce the session and speakers, there's a few announcements, a few housekeeping rules and so on from TWT. Firstly, to make the session more accessible, we'll be using a live transcription service called Otter. Attendees using Otter will have to follow a link and open the transcript as a, at a separate, in a separate window. The link will be shared in the chat box by a tech volunteer. If you're having difficulties, please message the tech volunteer on the chat. Secondly, the World Transform relies on your support to continue their great work year round. So far in the festival, it's very, very good. 94 people have signed up to the supporters network since the beginning of the festival, but they need more monthly su supporters to reach their target. I think about they need about 60 more to sustain their year round political education project. I'm a subscriber myself. I think we should all be, if you believe in decent political education, decent festivals. If you're able to spare a small, small, small monthly donation, please consider supporting them at the worldtransform.org forward slash support. And lastly, a few chat principles. We want everyone to feel welcome in these spaces and for everyone's voices to be heard. So please bear this in mind when engaging with chat. Please don't use inappropriate, rude or unkind language and please don't spam. Participants who stray from these principles may be prevented from further posting in the chat or comment box, but hopefully this won't happen. If you do have a question or comment for one of our speakers, please do fire away and include, include them in the Q&A towards the end. So I'll be looking at the comments uh, and we'll be selecting uh, the questions for our speakers. Globally and in the UK, we're facing unprecedented recessions, a global pandemic and, imminent, and an imminent climate, climate crisis. The stakes couldn't be higher, as they say, and our response will need to be equal to the task. Rather than considering ideal futures, our political desires and our visions of the good life to be frivolous extras, mere things for intellectual fancy, I'd argue that utopian imaginations are a key battleground for politics. We learned from an, an amazing session last week at TWT uh, of the ways in which conservative forces are trying to actualize their visions of inequality, of control, of deepening social divides. The left cannot afford to neglect offering a vision for the future, and while politics is always about the urgent here and now, about pragmatic decisions, it would be a mistake to become trapped into the corner of short-termism. The left has a strong tradition of utopian thought, from Marx and Engels' Communist Manifesto through to trade union demands for the shorter working week, as well as feminist and anti-racist movements throughout the past century. To discuss all of this, tonight we're fortunate to be joined by a brilliant panel of speakers, Theo, Theo Rio Francos, Cathy Weeks and Rebecca Long Bailey, MP. I'm going to introduce them all properly before they speak, and we're going to start with Thea. She, uh, Thea Frankos, in addition to holding fellowships in the Ratcliffe Foundation and the Andrew Carnegie Foundation, she's an assistant professor of political science at Providence College. She's co author of A Planet to Win, Why We Need a Green New Deal, which I can recommend personally, I've just finished it, published by Verso. Thea has been at the forefront of defending a bold systemic solution to the most pressing issue facing our world, climate change. Thank you, Thea, I'll leave it to you. Thanks so much, Will, um, and real pleasure and honor to be on this panel um, and looking forward to the conversation uh, throughout. Um, so in many ways, this is, to put it mildly, a counterintuitive moment to speak of utopia. Here in the United States, nearly 200,000 people have died from COVID-19. The largest wildfires on record have engulfed Western states, coinciding with an equally unprecedented hurricane season, an off-the-charts heat wave, and biblical floods. Millions are suffering economically, turning to food banks and living in fear of eviction with little hope of relief, and cities and states slashing social services and implementing austerity. Meanwhile, we live under a revanchist, cruel, and also idiotic government, and now face the prospect of a Supreme Court even more dominated by a conservatism completely unrepresentative of the vast majority of Americans. And all of these nightmares, of course, weigh heaviest on those on the bottom of a deeply racialized class hierarchy, growing more unequal by the day, as asset holders see record returns on investments, and the masses, especially people of color, are more vulnerable than ever. When we zoom out to the planetary scale, such tragedies and horrors loom even larger. Globally, the pandemic has claimed almost a million lives. Many more will be claimed by a deepening crisis of poverty, unemployment, and hunger, 
the growing sovereign debt that ties the hands of governments across the global south, the consolidation of right-wing authoritarianism, and all of this in the context of an accelerating climate emergency that punishes those least responsible for its root causes. To wit, in what should be an oxymoron, the world's largest wetland, the Pantanal, is literally on fire. Despair would, of course, be a reasonable response to the current conjuncture. The problem with despair, however intellectually or emotionally valid, is that it is a self-fulfilling prophecy. As socialists, we know that the only source of transformation is the collective capacities of the, of the exploited and the marginalized. If we don't believe in our power to create a new world, then surely we will not create one. In this sense, radical politics requires a leap of secular faith, a sense of fidelity to our own world-making powers. So instead of fatalism, I want to take seriously the abolitionist thinkers Miriam Kaba's provocation that hope is a discipline. I want to argue that the opposite of pessimism isn't self-assured optimism, but rather militant commitment to collective action in the face of uncertainty and danger. This is not a call to change our attitude. Such facile idealism has no place in materialist analysis or strategy. Rather, I want to suggest that we intentionally orient to the signs of radical possibility that are everywhere amidst the rubble of our broken world. In the United States, we just witnessed a months long black led multiracial uprising against police violence, mass incarceration, and the entire racialized class order that prisons and cops uphold. This was by all accounts, the single largest and most geographically and racially diverse movement that the US has ever seen. In the midst of this movement, which rapidly shifted public opinion and expanded the horizons of the possible, we have seen a wave of unabashedly left-wing electoral victories from city councils, state legislatures, all the way to the halls of Congress. These insurgents ran on platforms that centered the Green New Deal, defunding the police, strengthening our systems of care and social provision, and ensuring a dignified life for all. And they did so by mobilizing grassroots campaigns rooted in longstanding social movements, as well as newer formations, like the chapters of the Democratic Socialists of America, the country's largest socialist organization with over 70,000 members of which I am one. These are the signs that a bold left-wing politics that confronts the ruling class and offers a positive galvanizing vision of a world otherwise can exercise leverage in the streets and seize power in government. To underscore that the US left finds itself in a historically unusual position, that despite the defeat of our hoped for presidential candidate, Bernie Sanders, we are in all other ways more powerful in terms of mobilization, ideological influence, and access to levers of decision-making than we have been for decades. A power that I want to say is of course nowhere near enough, but remains in relative terms a substantial advance. I want to step back in time for a moment. The pandemic has of course made it hard to tell today from yesterday as weeks and months blur together, inducing a sense of forgetting about the lives we once lived. In the US, the sense of amnesia is exacerbated by a 24 seven sensationalist news cycle, the ever more short, even more foreshortened temporality of social media, and of course, a political elite insistent that everything was perfect before Trump, effacing their own deep complicity in producing the monster in the White House. It's all the more important then to remind ourselves and to recover recent history, to measure how far we've come and to understand thereby more concretely the size and the nature of the task that lies before us. I'd like to briefly narrate this recent history through the lenses of my own experiences on the left, not at all to center my own life, but to emphasize that our political orientations are formed through concrete encounters with the world, through our own moments of suffering and joy, through the networks of comrades in which we find ourselves and further cultivate, and through political education that sharpens our critiques and expands our revolutionary imaginations. I'm 36. Two decades ago, when I first joined left politics in the late 90s as a high school student in New York City, the left felt like an edgy subculture, a mere shadow of the mass movements of the 1930s and 60s that I learned about from Howard Zinn. It looked like dumpster diving and cooking up meals to give out food for free with food not bombs, like direct actions against the IMF or the corporations complicit in sweatshop labor, disseminated on quarter sheet flyers, wheat pasted posters, and indie media. 
I lost my faith in the two party system almost as quickly as I learned what it was, volunteering for Ralph Nader's Green Party campaign before I could even vote, a campaign that itself won enough votes to be blamed for Bush's election, but not enough to wield anything like power. I emerged even more of an anarchist than I entered. In the years that followed, I devoted myself to solidarity with inspiring movements in Latin America, movements fighting against neoliberalism and for popular power, indigenous self-determination, and regional sovereignty for, from U.S. imperialism. Unlike the U.S. left and unlike my own tendencies, these movements explicitly aim to transform and occupy the state, resulting in a historic wave of left governments. It is of course beyond today's program to delve into the complexity of the pink tide, but these experiments in left power, however fraught, put the state back on the left's agenda. Meanwhile, in the United States, in the wake of the financial crisis, the left began to find its footing again, organizing Occupy Wall Street, pushing back on Obama's triangulations, and radicalizing through Black Lives Matter and Standing Rock. The story from then I think we all know, Bernie's runs for office, the growth of explicitly socialist politics, and the impressive organizing that has occurred under the nightmarish Trump government. The left, in other words, is out of the wilderness. But what do we do now? I want to include with a few brief notes on program and strategy, themes which will surely resonate through the other um, panel presentations and our Q&A session. The first is the left should not shy away from utopianism. In fact, the only way to pragmatically confront the crises we face is to articulate bold visions and translate them into concrete demands around which to organize social movements and left electoral campaigns. The Green New Deal is a perfect example. At its most radical, the GND is a vision for a care-based society, for public and worker ownership, for decommodification and collective consumption, for green social housing, free, no carbon mass transit, car-free cities, democratized energy, and equitable global cooperation. In the United States, this left flank of the Green New Deal terrain is occupied by the Democratic Socialists of America, the Sunrise Movement, environmental justice organizations, indigenous movements, Black Lives Matter, and more. What does this vision look like in practice? We know, I think, that all of these policies are technically and economically feasible. But to be politically possible, they require muscular movements ready to pounce on any opportunity for radicalization and constantly cultivating skills of organizing, direct action, and leadership. Side by side with movements, they require leftists in office who understand their position is to be a tribune for the working class, to use procedure to obstruct the right, and to build legislative coalitions for socialist program. Not all of us has to do everything and not all of us, any of us can do everything. We each only have one life to lead and only so many hours and days increasingly squeezed by work, childcare and mere survival. But none of us can do anything alone. On this warming turbulent planet, the most important thing that each of us can do is join with others in left organizations and labor unions and embrace hope. That is, cultivate the discipline to avoid despair, orient to radical possibility, and understand that if the future is a battleground, we can only win if we believe in our power to do so. Thank you very much. Amazing, thanks there. I think this, the, the theme definitely of going from the bold, from the, from the concrete, the bold to the concrete basically is gonna be something which comes up again and again uh, in this panel. And I think there's something in your book, actually, you know, a green society or, or a society driven by the green you do is, is caring. Yeah, but also it's it doesn't have to be one of austerity or boredom. Actually, it can be, you know, um, it can provoke desire. The idea of, of there's a chapter, I think, talking about, you know, reducing the working week, but also, you know, new ways of like of leisure without carbon consumption and um, alternative hedonism. I think that was really um important and important part of the, the kind of green you do project. OK, great. So we're, we're very much on time, which is always good. Um, next, we have Kathy Weeks, who, through her research into the anti and post work politics of numerous socialist and feminist movements, has become one of the leading defenders of utopian perspective and strategy in radical politics uh, and, political, and political thought, I, I suppose. As Professor of Gender, Sexuality and Feminist Studies at Duke University, much of her write, recent writing has focused on the politics of universal basic income and reducing working time as both, both as key demands. 
it wouldn't be an exaggeration also to say you know that without Kathy's work autonomy simply wouldn't exist and it's been a huge inspiration for me personally so I'm very personally happy to have her on the panel uh Kathy I would leave it to you about 15 minutes thank you great thanks so thanks to Hope and Charlie, Jack, Will, Thea, and Becky for organizing and participating in this lovely panel. I wish we were in person, but there you go. So my task, as I understand it, is to try to get us to take a step back to reflect a bit on the concept and practice of utopia on a more abstract sort of uh, general or theoretical level. So what do we mean when we refer to utopia? What do other people mean when they talk about utopias? What can thinking about utopias or utopian thinking do for us? You know, what is its value as a form of speculation and as an idiom of political claims making? So I'm gonna start with what it's not. It's not a state of impossible perfection. Um, that's the anti-utopians definition of utopia. And using this as the definition, they've historically accused utopias of offering us or in their formulation, the masses, uh, escapist dreams that lead to quietism, quell dissent, siphon off activism, and or offering eitherly, either utterly naive or dangerously authoritarian dreams of a fully disciplined social order. So liberal thinkers and political actors have been typically among those most hostile to utopias and utopianism. And I'll just mention two historical examples of liberal anti-utopianism. One is invested in the claim that there should be no alternative to liberal democracy. Um, by this account, dreams of alternative systems are dangerous. The philosopher Karl Popper once insisted, leading us to either fascism or communism. In the post-war era, alongside the rise of li liberalism in its neoliberal form, it's then declared that not that there should be no alternative, but that there is no alternative. So what Karl Popper defended in the name of rationalism is now proclaimed under the banner of realism. Utopia is no longer dangerous, it's just irrelevant. In either case, right, and either when it, whether it's on the grounds of rationalism or realism, liberalism decries utopian political thought and activism, prescribing instead its only incremental reforms of liberal democratic systems. And that's, you know, again, and that anti-utopianism rests on a particular straw figure of what utopianism is. So with that ground cleared a bit, I'm gonna start with a very brief overview of some of the basic insights of the academic field of utopian studies, mentioning just a couple of authors along the way. So the term utopia is often associated with the form of the literary utopia, the European tradition of which dates back to Thomas More's 1516 utopia that laid out this fictional ideal society. So the word was invented by, by Moore, it's a pun in the original Greek. So topos means place, and then the oo sound could either sound like good or no. So it's either no place or good place, and it's kind of you know left to the reader to decide which one it is. But there are infant varieties and forms of utopian expression. Um, now, drawing on a scheme provided by the utopian scholars Barbara Goodwin and Keith Taylor, utopian literature or cultural production can be approached as a matter of content, as a matter of form, and a matter of function. So to read utopia or hear a utopian proposal in terms of the content of its vision of a good society is to take it most literally. So Tom Moylan, in his classic book, Demand the Impossible, sorts these into traditional utopias like Thomas More's and what he calls critical utopias that started to be produced in the 1960s and 1970s by authors like Ursula Le Guin and Samuel Delaney, um, authors that had reservations about the traditional utopia imagined as an ideal blueprint. And they offered instead much more partial and decidedly more modest visions of better societies, but nonetheless imperfect, incomplete, and impermanent. Some describe these more critical utopias and the, the critical utopian approach in terms of utopia and utopian speculation that is an ongoing process, right? Rather than endpoints or finished products. So by this more workable understanding, utopian specula speculation results in endless partial visions of better but never perfect societies. 
Now, the formal qualities of the literary utopia are also variable. For one thing, whereas utopias like Moore's were imagined spatially as existing in some you know, island or as yet unmapped enclave, by the 20th century, Euro-American utopias were often imagined temporally, right, as in some more or less distant future. Science fiction then becomes and continues to be one of the leading genres of utopian speculation. And to stretch the formal genre of utopianism even further, we can also add utopia as a, the utopian demand as a political form, right? A demand for substantial reforms or policies that we're not likely to win soon, as in the demand for a guaranteed income or shorter hours. And I think of these as utopian demands. But I'm more interested in the functions of utopian forms um, and contents. And I'm gonna briefly outline two main functions of utopian thinking. The first is a critical function, sometimes referred to in terms of utopia's capacity to produce an estrangement effect. That is to provide an alternative in an imagined future. You know, a better future in the case of utopia, a worse future in the case of a dystopia from which we can then reflect critically on the present. So by imagining a different world where life is radically transformed, where the rules of the game have been changed, we can get some critical distance from the ideologically enclosed, protected, naturalized common sense of our present ways of living. You know, so a fish doesn't know it's wet, right, until it gets out of the water. And in that sense, utopian visions of alternatives get us out of the water or sometimes by, you know, leaving Earth on a spaceship, I guess. Right, taking us, you know, to a different world from which we can get a new angle of vision on really what's going on on Earth. So sometimes it's only in the marked absence of a problem in some utopian world, for example, you know, imagine a feminist utopia that that paints a world where there's just no sexual violence. It just doesn't exist. Right. That allows us to recognize just how big an impact the problem has on our daily lives in this society. So that's part of the critical function of utopia. Frederick Jameson famously takes this critical function to its logical conclusion in a way, arguing that even failed utopian visions, visions that aren't really very good at imagining truly different kinds of humans or social relations, can still function as critical tools. Because while their contents might be kind of lame, right, less something new than more of, you know, the same in some respects, they might succeed in demonstrating to us, instructing us about the limits of our own imagination, the way we are stuck within the ideological present. So imagine again that, you know, hypothetical feminist utopia where, you know, it, it succeeds in imagining this world where sexual violence just does not exist, but but still imagines, I don't know, sexual relations as centering around the traditional couple form, right? I mean, so in some ways it's an expansive imagination. Sometimes it's just really, really limited in that sense too, but that can tell us something about the limits of our own imagination about human relations. So the first function is to leverage some critical insights into our present society, the contours of which have been defamiliarized enough through this utopian method that we can see it in a new light. The second function of utopian thinking speculation is to redirect our attention and energies towards an open future. So if estrangement is central to the critical function, hope, as Thea already mentioned, is necessary for what I would call its provocation function. So by providing a figure of hope or by demonstrating how to exercise hopefulness, by providing a vision or even a glimmer of a better social world, the utopia can serve to animate political desire to engage our aspirations to new and more satisfying forms of collectivity. Um, there's a great version of this insight offered by a French utopian theorist, Miguel Abensur, who described the role of utopia as the education of desire. And then E.P. Thompson explains it this way, right? It's the role of you utopia to quote, to teach desire to desire, to desire better, to desire more, and above all, to desire in a different way, end quote. 
So by this reading, the power of utopias is less to prescribe what we should want than to provoke us to think about what we might want. So utopian vision, glimpse, or even a utopian political demand can inspire our political imaginations, which is not something we often have occasions to exercise because we're much more limited often to trying to decide between the choices between candidate A and candidate B, rather than really exercising some kind of imaginative capacity. So by poking and prodding us to expand our sense of what might be possible in our social and political relations, Frederick Jameson explains it this way, quote, utopia as a form is not the representation of radical alternatives, it is rather simply the imperative to imagine them, end quote. So to illustrate, I've got a few more minutes, to illustrate how a utopian demand can be not a liability, as some critics would have it, but a strength, I'm gonna use the demand for a basic income as an example. And I hesitate to do this because I really don't want us to debate the merits or demerits of basic income. I only wanted to use it as an example of a utopian demand, and I hope we could debate utopian demands um, if you'd like. But when I started for, you know, advocating for a demand for basic income many, many years ago, it was widely acknowledged as a utopian demand. And I think it might be less so today, um, but I think still to argue in the form of a universal livable basic income still counts as a utopian demand in the sense that it's a demand that requires a long fight, right? And although it's not in itself something that would create a significantly better world, a utopian vision itself, it does point us in the direction of something different. So I think it still counts as a utopian demand. So if we do read it as a utopian demand, then the point I wanna make is that beyond a concrete policy proposal that its proponents think would carry many benefits, it can also function as a critical perspective and a provocation. So it can still fulfill some of these two utopian functions. So in order to make sense of the demand, in this case for a basic income, in order for its defenders to, to be successful in explaining for it, explaining it and advocating for it, um, we have to confront the common sense about how waged work and family are supposed to function and develop a critical perspective on their actual failures as systems of income distribution. So there's this critical pedagogical function of the demand and the practice of demanding and advocating for it that I think is really important to understand for a political demand. As a provocation, the demand at its best can challenge people to stretch their imagination of what might be possible and to imagine what they might do with a life that was less strictly or absolutely tethered to the job or to the family form. So there's something about the longer time frame of the struggle for a utopian demand as opposed to a more sort of narrowly practical demand that is not just a drawback or a problem, but is actually an opportunity to do some of the ideological and cultural work that is also part of meaningful social change. Okay, I'm going to stop there. Amazing. Thank you, Kathy. We are still very much on time. Um, that was great. I think there's, this is something which I drew from your work, particularly when we're you know, um, thinking of, you know, how to make change, I think it's really important to have this, both this, the provocation and, and the kind of distancing that, that um, utopias, utopian demands kind of give. Um, and I can see in the chat room, the education of desire was a, was a bit of a hit of that, that, that E.P. Thompson um, phrase. So I think we'll, there's a few questions, but we'll come back to them um, in the Q&A. Um, for now, let's move on to uh, Becky. So last but no, by no means least, we're joined by Rebecca Long Bailey MP, who represents Salford and Eccles for the Labour Party in Westminster. As Shadow Secretary for, of State for Business, Energy and Industrial Strategy in Jeremy Corbyn's Shadow Cabinet, Becky is one of the prominent advocates and designers of Labour's policy for a green industrial revolution and a big advocate for uh, a Green New Deal and a big supporter of the Green New Deal campaign. A consistent defender of not only bold, ambitious policies, but also the need to connect them to grassroots communities. We're delight that she could join us this evening. And I like to think, you know, there's, there's the variety on the panels is, is kind of satisfying this evening. On the one hand, we have you know MPs, we also have um, kind of campaigns for a Green New Deal, and we have the utopian theorists. So I think Becky's rounding off a, a kind of complete package, as it were. Uh, Becky, I'll leave it to you. You have plenty of time, so please take us as long as you need. 
Brilliant. Thanks so much, Will. And it's a real pleasure to come after the brilliant speakers that we've had already, Thea and Cathy. I've certainly had my mind uh, broadened tonight by their contributions, that's for sure. Well, the topic of tonight's session is lack of utopianism, obviously. But for the minute, do we even consider such a thing, the vision of a future society where poverty has been eradicated, where people are valued and secure, and where we all work together for the common good. At this time, of profound misery and worry, well, it just feels a bit like an indulgent luxury to some of us, doesn't it? Well, you know, that vision of a new economy, whether it's a universal public service uh, offering public ownership, secure housing for all, a universal basic income, new industries, a job guarantee, a manifesto for workers' rights and fundamental human rights. All of that is actually more important now than ever if we actually can have any chance of seriously protecting health and lives at the moment, whether it's the furlough scheme, whether it's support for businesses, whether it's support for those within their homes who haven't got enough to live on. Because what we need now is underpinned by an economy that can support the cost of safety at now in the future. Now, the pandemic has shown us how precarious the safety and security of many workers have been. And it fast tracks the need for policymakers to outline a roadmap for rebuilding the economy so that it works for us rather than us serving it. And during the lockdown, we saw how important our essential workers were, particularly whether it was your bus drivers, your postal workers, your lorry drivers, your supermarket workers, you name it. They went to work every day, putting their own lives at risk to keep us going at that difficult time. And in many cases, for example, with health workers, they were fighting for the basic PPE they needed to do their job to keep themselves safe. And for those non-essential workers, I had many constituents across Salford who were still asked to go to work. They weren't essential workers. Um, and this was before the era of so-called COVID control workplaces. Many of them were in warehouses and social distancing was nigh on impossible. And very few of them dared to speak out, obviously, because they were frightened of losing their jobs. And then beyond that, of course, we saw the easing of the lockdown. And we were told that we get the economy moving. And apparently, we have to balance the need uh, to protect public health with the health of the economy. We saw the school article. There was no Sorry. 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 There's just a lot of chat about do you have the audio is really bad? Is there any chance you have headphones? Uh, I haven't, no, sorry. Okay, no, that's fine. We thought we'd just check, just because the, like, the audio is... that make it better? Um, not sure. Um, it, it, weird enough, the audio is better when I'm also on. So maybe if I just stay here <laughs> you, and you keep going, <laughs> let's just let's just try yeah. that, okay? Yeah. Okay. Do you want, do you want um, to just like, maybe go back about five minutes? You've got plenty of time. Sorry. Do we go back from the start? Where, um, where yeah, I mean, let's go, let's go, let's go back to the start, I think, or, or just after, just because I think we've got time and it's worth, we'd like to hear what you have to say. Um, so let's, okay. let's try. Okay, sorry. Okay, so sorry if I'm repeating myself uh, to anyone who's heard this before, but obviously tonight's discussion is about left utopianism and it feels a little bit luxurious to be talking about left utopianism at a time of such profound misery and worry. But the reality is, is that that vision of a new economy that left utopianism offers, whether it's universal public services, public ownership, a universal basic income, homes for all, uh, and for workers and, and human rights, it's actually more important now than ever when we sit back against the backdrop uh, of what is required to protect people at this difficult time. And we need to show that we've got an economic plan that will pay for the support that people need at this crucial time. Now, the pandemic itself has been horrendous, and uh, I don't think it's an underestimation to show, uh, you know, to, to say that it's shown how precarious much of our workforce is. It was bad before this crisis, but the crisis has certainly shone that spotlight on our workforce, whether it was our essential workers who were putting their lives at risk during the pandemic to keep the country going and to make sure that we had what we needed in our homes, all the way through to non-essential workers, who in many cases were still asked to go to work, many in warehouses or building sites, where social distancing was nigh on impossible. 
and they didn't speak out in many cases because they were frightened of losing their jobs. And then when we saw the easing of lockdown, we were told very clearly that it was to get the economy moving because apparently we had to balance the need to protect public health against the health of the economy. And at the start, we saw the schools debacle. There was a lot of discussion about whether we should reopen schools or not. And the government had no real plan. The guidance they issued was changed up to 41 times. And we saw the demonisation of trade unions who spoke out about safety and wanted a real plan put in place to protect school children and indeed their families and those staff members that were within schools. Um, and they also asked for a plan B in the event that we saw outbreaks so that you could have blended at home in school learning. But none of that was taken into account, unfortunately. And then we saw the government encourage people who could work from home to go to work and just have a reasonable chat with their boss about making sure that their workplace was OK. And as we know, many workplaces won't be OK. There are fantastic employers that will move heaven and earth to, to make things as safe as possible. But there are some that won't do that. And with the health and safety executive having had its budget slashed over the last 10 years, there are not many workplaces that can expect, expect a visit from a health and safety representative to actually make sure that COVID secure really means COVID secure. And then, of course, there were all the people who didn't receive any government support at all. We had the furlough scheme put in place, right? We had um, those people that could pause their mortgage payments. Great. Rent evictions banned temporarily. Great. Although that comes to an end this weekend and the furlough scheme will come to an end very soon as well. But there were three million people across the UK who had access to no support at all. Self-employed, those new starters, small businesses, all worrying how to make one week to the next and whether they were actually going to be able to pay their rent or mortgages. And now, as the infection rate rises exponentially now, we're told, the government tells us that we still need to get back to work, even if you can work from home. Yet the world-beating test, track and trace system doesn't seem to exist. It's not world-beating. And certainly, if you live in Salford, if you needed a test over the last two weeks, if you were lucky enough to get one, quite often you were being sent to Inverness or Landudno, hundreds and hundreds of miles away. It was an absolute shambles. But, you know, in terms of the argument about putting the economy first or putting public health first, I actually don't blame people for thinking that they've got to make the choice between beating the virus and going to work to keep their jobs, because many do feel forced to choose between health and their livelihood. We know, as I said, that the furlough scheme and the rent ban evictions going to come to an end soon and even if those people who were in secure work could um, go to work and feel safe if they got sick in many cases they'd revert to statutory sick pay which is a measly £95.85 a week it's certainly not enough for anybody to live on and it's well below where other leading industrial nations are now that of course that's for workers who are lucky enough to get sick pay at all because there are many on zero hour contracts and other gig economy workers who have no security at work at all and of course they will be faced with the horrible situation where if they are sick they'll have to think about what's what's more important getting better or going to work and that's not a choice they should ever be forced to make so you see we're already in a crisis before this pandemic hit workers rights and financial security have been eroded and decades of deindustrialization have left whole regions economically fragile. Most people are only one paycheck away from financial devastation. And with the prospect of mass job losses on the horizon, some inevitable due to the lack of support and some deliberately manufactured by unscrupulous employers, unfortunately. And we've got the worst financial crisis that we have ever seen. Now, we're also facing another existential crisis, as Thea has already pointed out, climate change. And it's interesting how you look at how the two arguments surrounding both issues seem to have a common theme. How we're told that it's a juggling act between protecting public health, protecting jobs and protecting the economy. But in both cases, 
it's not an argument that we should ever have to make and nor do we need to because protecting lives and protecting incomes shouldn't be a trade-off they should go hand in hand and it's our job to set out exactly what needs to be done to ensure that that can happen and there's a few very brief points that i just wanted to run through in terms of where our policy making could potentially take us next so the first issue is the area of workers' rights, which needed to be strengthened before the pandemic hit. And that meant introducing sectoral collective bargaining, restoring and expanding trade union rights, creating a single status of worker so that every single worker has protection from day one, boosting the minimum wage, reducing working hours and establishing a minimum income guarantee. The second point, is the safety net that people need to protect themselves from the pandemic. And that must be provided without equivocation, in my view. That means extending furlough, it means banning evictions, it means supporting the three million who've been excluded from government support so far, it means decent sick pay, it means the right to work from home where this is possible, and stringent health and safety measures where it's not, and it means a properly resourced test, track, trace and isolate regi regime with fast results. And yes, we should be looking at supporting sectors who are in crisis and businesses to protect their jobs in return for conditions like good treatment and pay of workers, trade union access, carbon reduction, and even public equity stakes in large businesses who receive bailouts. And then the third point, and this leads me back into the vision of utopia, if you like, and our big ideas, it's how do we pay for the support that people need to stay safe now? Now, of course, we could talk about modern monetary theory as one option. But the other option is how do you invest in industry so that it generates sufficient future returns to give you stability within the economy? That's the million dollar question, isn't it? Well, we needed the biggest industrial plan that the country has ever seen. From sector specific plans to public infrastructure projects to keep the economy going. But we also had that option contained very neatly within a Green New Deal, a Green Industrial Revolution. And we did a, a, quite a detailed and extensive report within the Labour Party just before the last general election where we showed how we could try and decarbonise just our energy sector alone by 2030. And there were 30 things that we needed to achieve by 2030. And the whole package was to be a catalyst for manufacturing, for rebuilding deindustrialized towns across the UK. And at its very heart was that utopianism. It was a plan to restructure and rebalance the economy as we know it, using elements of public ownership to drive the change we needed to see and to redistribute prosperity to those who needed it. So one example is where we proposed to take a majority public stake in new wind farms. And that meant that even if we just took a 51% stake in those new businesses, we'd have the power to support local businesses, local supply chains. We'd have the power to make sure that in the contracts we issued, we could put good moral uh, detail in there, whether it was protecting workers, decent pay, um, decent kind of treatment of um, the local community and, and wider corporate decision making. It was all there for us to be able to instill that new a moral culture and a moral compass within industry, if you like. And also the work that we did there showed that with an average required investment of about 1.9% of GDP, just on energy alone, we'd have provided a net benefit of £800 billion across the UK by 2030 and 850,000-odd new jobs across the green energy sector. And it was also argued that because we generated that much investment within the economy overall, that would see an increase in wages of up to 2% right across the economy. So that's just one tiny element of the Green New Deal that we looked at. So you can see how the possibilities to drive forward the change, both economically and on a political level, they were there for the taking and we shouldn't shy away from that. And what we need to do now is build upon that because certainly, um, the government that we've got in power at the moment is not decarbonising the economy at the rate that we need to see it. So we've got far more work to do to try and catch up to where we need to be to try and reach net zero um, before 2030. So, yes, we do face one of the biggest economic and health crises we've ever seen. But my message tonight through this 
talk about left utopianism is to say that if we don't use this moment now to instigate economic change on a massive scale to explain and demonstrate how our policy ideas are a means to rebuild the economy and society in a way that people deserve, then it won't just be our recovery from the pandemic or tackling climate change that will be in peril. It's going to be any shred of trust that we're trying to build in our communities that we've actually got the answers to the real problem that they face. And what we face now, it's not just a road to utopianism. I don't want to depress everybody, but it's a fight for survival. It's a battle to protect our health in the face of 40 years of neoliberalism that told us that we were expendable to economic forces far greater than us. It's the battle for the value of human life. But if we can show how people can be protected now, and as this pandemic ends, we show how we can build an economic future worthy of our communities, where the role of government and the economy is the betterment of its people, not the profits of a select few, then we can sow the seeds for what people really deserve. That's a future of security, solidarity and respect, a future built by us, for us. And that might be utopianism to some, but I call it our fundamental human right. Thank you very much. Hopefully you heard all. Thanks. No, you did. That was Even though I dropped out, you carried on being very clear. Thanks, uh, Becky. And I think there's... There's something interesting going on in, in, in so far as, you know, these things, these, these changes we need to make, they're, they're not utopian in the bad sense. They're absolutely necessary. Right. And that's the that's the thing about them, that they can't be insulted as utopian because they're precisely the things we need. But at the same time, they're good, utopian in a good way, in a kind of in a, in a productive manner to, to provoke, provide a kind of vision of how we get out of this mess and how we actually counter um environmental degradation basically. And so I think there's there's uh, it's an interesting kind of mix there of, of kind of um, of, of what's going on with it, uh, our re kind of utopianism. Now, I think we've probably got plenty of time, so I think we're going to bring all the speakers in. Can we, can we get everyone into the little? Yeah, here we go. Um, so we have plenty of good questions. Um, I think we'll start with, uh, there's one, there's one uh, from Hal, which is, I think this is, I think this should go to Thea and uh, Becky, actually, so how can activists apply Green New Deal type ecological transformation at the level of their campus and community, um, basically because the national government is it's kind of blocked. So I guess local Green New Deals, kind of local tra transformative change. Let's let's go there first, then we'll see if, if Becky wants to say something about that. Thank you. Um, a great question because it's like super relevant both to the UK and the US and honestly to a lot of the EU where the right or where neoliberals are in power. Um, so I think it's, it's an important one. Um, I, in general terms, I don't per se view like localism as the way we should approach like planetary problems. However, even if the ultimate solutions aren't like locally bounded, I think we start from where we are when we organize, right? And that's in our in our towns and our neighborhoods and our cities and on our campuses and in our workplaces. And those can be springboards for broader and more geographically encompassing movements, but they can also be like laboratories to test out new ideas, whether it's strategic ideas of how to create broad coalitions or whether it's like, the policy making ideas of how to implement Green New Deal style policies. Um, and then those can be scaled up. Um, in the US, uh, this is in some ways a little more straightforward because we have a sort of federal system of governance in which there is political power, although not always economic power at local scales of government. There's some of that in the UK, though not quite, not maybe quite as much of a, a range of what the local can do, but but there's certainly things that local councils can do can do on their own without you know a, 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 the national government agreeing with them. Um, there are areas that are very relevant to the Green New Deal that local governments in the U.S. and the U.K. and elsewhere in Europe have some degree of leverage over, whether it's housing, transit, or or the energy grid. Um, but at the same time, you know, as I was sort of referencing, there are these severe financial constraints, especially when we have neoliberals in power nationally there's often like austerity budgets at the local at the local level so i think one thing that folks in local government who embrace a green new deal kind of platform and are doing what they can to implement it locally should think about is like collective action across localities like what would it look like for 
um, you know, anywhere that there's labor, left labor people in local council in the U.S. in the U.K., excuse me, to band together with one another, like trans locally and like press their demands for better funding on national government, right? This has happened in, in the EU um, with uh, the radical municipalist movement, like both within France and Spain and, and elsewhere, where there hasn't just been experiments locally within their cities to like ban cars or increase affordable housing, but there's also been a coordination across radical municipalist movements to press, to press on national governments and the EU itself for better funding. I'm not saying that it has been successful overall, but like some kind of coordination I think is, is absolutely um, necessary. And then just to get to the, the campus question, um, there's lots of interesting stuff happening on campuses in the US in general. Right now, of course, campuses are like COVID outbreak at the center. Is that, so I'm gonna put that aside for a moment, but just like in the past few years, we've seen amazing climate strikes. We've seen divestment campaigns, fossil fuel divestment and also BDS. Um, campaigns. We've seen more recently successful campaigns to eliminate campus policing, to be in solidarity with uh, grad, work, grad workers, faculty, precarious faculty and staff that are striking. Um, so there's lots of interesting stuff that, that um, undergraduate students can do um, um, on campus-based campaigns. Um, and then I also think there's interesting examples of sort of campus-based campaigns that, that enter into coalitions beyond the campus. Um, but I, I just want to reiterate that we should definitely see localities as as laboratories for visionary Green New Deal policies. This is happening to some extent in New York, in California, elsewhere in the states now, um, uh, because it's absolutely true that that we don't have a hold on national power in either the U.S. and U.K., um, but that doesn't mean we should um, give up. And, and the locality is, is a place that we can begin. Um, so I'll, I'll stop it there. Thanks there. And just to, just to tweak the question a little bit to you, Becky, you, you know, as as you've said, you know, we, it's been demonstrated what the Green New Deal could do for, for localities up and down the country, whether it's, um, you know, yeah, southwest, the northeast and so on. Um, how do we bring that home to um, the everyday lives of people? How do we convince them that the, the Green New Deal is the vision um, or the future, which is which is worth fighting for? Yeah, and then this is, goes right to the heart of, it's one of the reasons why we called the Green New Deal the Green Industrial Revolution when we were trying to put it out there as a Labour Party, is that you've got to be able to explain to people that it will improve their lives, it will give their kids jobs, it will make their local area richer and more prosperous. It's not just about climate change, that's the whole kind of point of it, but the benefits that come with it are that prosperity, and it also gives us the opportunity to put more democracy within our economy, instill more public ownership so that the profits that these new companies generate actually go back into our community. So again, with the example of offshore wind, which was one element of our Green New Deal, we were looking at making sure that a certain percentage of the profits created by those companies would be invested in the local communities that they serve so it could go into your public realm so that people could actually see tangible benefits. So my kind of request really to anybody that's on a campus is yeah you know campaign to get your university to divest its pension fund from fossil fuels yeah you know lobby your local authority and encourage them to invest more but remember this is about creating a story that every single person within a community will buy into and they'll want it they'll want to have that better life as a result of it and at the moment, you've got fantastic, you know, green movements all over the world. But does that resonate if you're knocking on a door in some, you know, in a part of my constituency? No, because we've not done enough to tell the story. And that's the next stage of this now. It's to show how these decisions will improve our lives economically and morally and also improve our health. Great. Thanks. Um, um, there's another interesting question. I think this is that's related to something I want to ask Kathy because there's something here from Alex Brent. Um, working people very often don't have the time or energy to engage with union organising or activism or, um, you know, let alone utopian ideas. How do you make hope accessible? Now I know hope's a key affect that you talk about in your in your book, Kathy. So I wonder if you can speak to that question. How can we have time for utopianism? Yeah, no, I think that's a great question because I mean I think this the time crunch that, that we experience in the present day is both a symptom of the problems with it, and it's also a primary mechanism that keeps us 
sort of uh, keeps our, you know, keeps our heads down, our noses to the grindstone, you know, just concerned with the daily struggle to make a living. And I, and again, I think that does militate against the kind of utopian speculation and dreaming and, and desiring that I do think we need to make more time for. I guess, well, here's an, I mean, here's one way of trying to think about that is, is to, to maybe recognize how we do this kind of utopian speculation, desire, and hopefulness in, in so much of our activism, you know, in our political life and recognize even when we think we're, you know, we're banding together in order to sort of try to push through the most kind of concrete and narrowly focused policy, we're still in this mode constantly engaging this kind of you know, utopian speculation about what kind of world we want. And that maybe, maybe what we need to do is value that a little bit more. Cause I'm thinking about so many experiences that I've had, you know, going back to the alter globalization movements and this happened constantly. And there'd be young people confronted with representatives in power. And they would be talking about the problems with the IMF and the World Bank and the structure of living and their hopes for a different kind of world. And they would be sort of chided for their lack of knowledge. They say, you know, who runs the IMF? Who are the people? And, and these young people didn't know. And then they were chided for not having enough knowledge. And yet I, I kind of want to chide the people in power for not being able to think in these broader kinds of terms about what kind of world we want to live in. And, and maybe, so maybe my answer would be, we do need to kind of make time for that in movements, but to recognize how much of that is already happening and to actually value that a little bit more about as one of the strengths of what it means to be involved in a political movement. That, that another way to kind of flip it and to think about it a little differently. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah, thank you. Um, so let me look at other questions we have here. Um, da, 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 da. So there's, there's a question here which is interesting about um, time, and I think there's something for all three of you can speak to, which is basically, you know, the, the kind of horizon of utopia often is the kind of like long game. So the idea that you know this is this is what the neoliberals did very well, right? That in the, in the 1930s and 40s that they realised that their vision of utopia, that we you have know, like kind of fierce free market capitalism, that's probably a, a long way off. We've got to keep striving to get there, um, and it'll take a while. Lots of activism, lots of um, kind of chiding away. Um, at, at the kind of current common sense. So often utopia seems to be kind of a horizon you work towards, but at the same time in the last six months, you know, history seems to accelerate very quickly. A lot of these demands which seemed utopian, such as, you know, universal basic income, perhaps shorter working weeks, and so on, even you know, nationalization. You know, this was a part of Labour's manifesto in 2019. It was often criticized and suddenly the railways were nationalized like that in the UK um, uh, in order to kind of cope with the pandemic. So. Yeah. There's a, there's a question of the time frame here that often utopia is a long a long range um, goal which kind of guides our activism guides our um, political um, strategy but at the same time we live in a contracted moment so the question is uh, I'm kind of paraphrasing a, a question from the um, uh, from Dickon here uh, how do the long time frames of utopian demands work or function when faced with the immediate urgent reality um, and that's both because obviously we have to focus on the present I suppose but also because some of these demands are becoming less utopian and more uh, pragmatic. So I guess that's there's some somewhere in there. There's a question. Yeah. Um, I wanted to in order to jump in on that. So the kind of how do we not lose? Maybe how do we not lose sight of of a, of a broader transformational change in the in the midst of urgent pragmatic realities? Um, you know, for example, the government, you know, particularly in the UK, is spending a lot of money at the moment. It used to be a very left wing call to say, please spend more money. Uh, we need to spend on the austerity is not the way how do we adapt our demands in an age where where um things are changing so fast maybe um i'll jump in on this if that's okay um briefly and i'm really curious what others think to say i think the sort of her temporal horizon of, of utopian being sort of long ranging is a really interesting one and sort of resonates with what Kathy was saying about the sort of dual meaning of, of utopia as, as nowhere and as a good place, right? But this nowhere feeling like, how do we ever get there? Uh, is it, almost imminent in, in the term itself. Um, this is something that we, um, my co-authors and, and myself on, on a planet to win thought about a lot. Like the Green New Deal 
in its most radical potentiality is like a huge transformation that will take many years of really hard political struggle to win um, and will be won in unevenly, like we'll win some battles, we'll lose other battles, we'll reorient, et cetera. And so how to think about the, the vision of the Green New Deal um, spanning towards the present, meaning how to make it feel visceral, visceral and tangible and concrete right now, even though it's like a long road and a long struggle. Um, so one of the things we thought about there is like how movements, how the most kind of vibrant, muscular, popular movements like win by sequencing their demands and their tactics, like win by knowing um, uh, how to kind of get shorter term victories, when to escalate, um, when to sort of regroup and rethink and how that kind of sequencing process can make things viscerally felt while like maintaining momentum for winning more moving forward. Um, and I wanna take a really concrete example of this from, from the US and from um, DSA, Democratic Socialists of America campaigns locally within the US. Um, one of our big visions for a Green New Deal, for an eco-socialist Green New Deal, as we call it in DSA, is to think about energy democracy, which is like democratizing our, our energy system and also decommodifying it and decarbonizing it and more radically like decolonizing it, right? And that's a really big, you know, transformative vision for how to totally change how we relate to energy. Um, but we need to organize concrete campaigns that win pieces of that. So how do we do that? Um, and hearkening back to the first question, these are local and state level campaigns because in the US we have a energy system that's totally fragmented and each like municipality or state kind of has its own like energy market and, and systems. So what some of these energy campaigns have realized is that it's really hard to change ownership right away, meaning to take a utility and make it from a private utility to a public one like in a year. Um, the, the legal barriers to that are high and you have to you know, learn the law and learn regulations and change the statute and blah, blah, blah. So you need lots of like socialists actually in office in order to achieve that. But there are shorter term fights that we can wage, whether it's, for example, um, a moratorium on utility shutoff. So when people can't pay their bills um, to make sure that these private companies can't just shut people off, given there's you know, big public health risks even to not obviously having hot water or hot food or things like that. So a moratorium on shutoffs. The other sort of more positively and, and reiterating some things that, that Rebecca said earlier is like getting the public sector to invest in renewable energy and to retrofit and make buildings more energy efficient, especially for low income people. So, you know, winning those types of things is, is more doable in the short term than completely transferring the ownership from the private to the public or even more more utopianly from the private to like worker ownership or community ownership or things like that. Um, but I think that like winning those first kind of sets the stage for these larger battles over like who owns the means of energy production um, and situates us better for those. Cool, thank you. Do you, 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 you want to jump on that question? I know the question was quite a long time ago, if you can remember what it was. Yeah, um, I, I like to. I mean, yeah, and I, I, I agree with everything. <laughs> You said, and I guess, you know, if you think about these sort of utopian utopian demands and then narrowly pragmatic demands, there always has to be a, some kind of dialectical relationship between them. Obviously, each one is in, necessary and, in, in, you know, insufficient on its own in some ways, but that's obviously easier said than done. So I thought these examples from DSA were really good because in some ways there was a kind of consistency between this broad vision of eco-socialism and then these specific campaigns and, you know, attempts to try to get, you know, um, to more, you know, dealing with the moratoriums on shutdowns and things like that. And they're all of a piece. And I guess, you know, the worst examples are, you know, that, you know, that they end up being contradictory to one another. I think that's what most often happens in less coherent sort of campaigns. So I'm thinking about, you know, in this present moment, you know, in the US, you know, the demand for more jobs might be sort of, you know, I mean, might be sort of immediate relief to some, but at the expense of any kind of larger vision of what we really need to do, which is a massive transformation of the relationship between production and reproduction and work and life that can actually be adequate to larger numbers. And so I think. That's an example of where a more immediately legible, manageable reform is actually counterproductive 
to the larger sort of utopian push rather than the examples Thea gave of them being sort of working together in that way. And, and, in, and in that case, I think it's always important to sort of think about the dangers in my example of, you know, pushing for more jobs um, as a way to deal with the, the income gen, you know, crisis of COVID, there's a danger in remaining, only remaining legible within the existing political discourse, um, recognizing that we always have to expand the terms of the conversation at the same time. And that's another way of thinking about the relationship between narrowly pragmatic demands and more utopian demands is you know, how are you going, I mean, you need to sort of get what you need right now, but you also have to change the, the terms of the conversation and the debate and what's imaginable and what's considered, you know, politically legible. And I think that's another way to think about how these demands interact. That's, that's a really good point. I think that actually there's something, um, this is this is a question for you, Becky, in a way, just, just a segue into the discussion that, you know, in the UK, there was that very early on in COVID, there was the, in, in the pandemic, there was that poll which showed that only you know, a very small amount of people surveyed really wanted to go back to the economy that we had before, that, that, that they thought change was something which they didn't want this change, they didn't want a pandemic, but they, that change was something they, they really wanted and they had no nostalgia for the kind of the last 10, 10 20, 20, 30 years um, of, of the labour market, the economy and so on. So speaking to what you know, Catherine was just saying about, um, you know, of course, there's we need to, to some extent, speak within the 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 language that we 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 know we need you know jobs we need um, welfare we need to make sure our health systems functioning but at the same time there seems to be an appetite a desire for you know wide what like a large scale change and i guess the question i guess the question for you if you want to speak to the, this kind of issue of how do we you know how do we speak to that desire of widespread change while also um you know meeting people's immediate needs and i think not to sound opportunistic here but there is something which this pandemic has shown us, shown us the value of work, it's shown us of some kinds of work versus others, it's shown us um, the, the necessity for a social security net and so forth. So I wonder if there is a sea change here, which the pandemic has kind of opened kind of the Pandora's box as it were. And I wonder if you could you know, want to speak to that kind of dynamic in a way. Definitely. And I think, I mean, it's not as if those these issues weren't ex in existence before the pandemic hit, of course they were, but they didn't really cut through. Uh, in the way that they did when we first started going into lockdown and people saw how precarious they were, that they were only a couple of paychecks away from losing their houses and their livelihoods. And that wasn't just, um, you know, those traditionally who would, would struggle, you know, at the lower end of the income scale, you know, you were seeing the so-called middle classes that were potentially struggling now. And it certainly brought it out into the fore and the demands for a change started to be heard. There was also the issue of working from home was that a lot of people started working from home and realised that the world didn't end if they weren't stuck in the office. And they started to, to think, well, actually, you know, when we go back to normal, why shouldn't I be able to do this more? Why can't I have more of a flexible uh, work-life balance? But I think what certainly we need to do across the movement now is to highlight the issues that people are facing. So the, the first big fight we've got at the minute is the end of the furlough scheme. There are employees right across the country who are potentially going to be pushed off a cliff edge in the next month or so when furlough ends. So we've got to campaign to make sure that they get the protection that they deserve. The next hurdle that we've got is about reforming corporate culture. There are a lot of businesses who are going to hit the wall because of the state of the economy and they need help from government and we need to be asking the government to help them and to put conditions on that help, those bailouts if you like, but there are also a lot of unscrupulous employers who are going to make people redundant and have started to do so because it's an opportune time for them to do that. So the time for corporate reform is now and it's really going to be brought to the public for It's not a sexy, sexy subject to talk about, as I know that I've tried to talk about it myself often enough and people just fall asleep. But now is the time to bring that subject into people's um, consciousnesses, if you like. Um, the other thing that I wanted to talk about is about <clears throat> universal services and social care and health particularly. Now, everybody loves a social care system and they'd love for us to have comprehensive social care free at the point of use. But people are conditioned to think that that's something that we can't have, that we can't afford it. And I think as left policymakers now, 
we've got to set out a package to show that it's possible. As in the same way that we've done with the Green New Deal, we've got to do that with the social care because it is possible and it will mean, you know, restructuring and huge ideas, but it has to be done. And I think that's something that could be used in tandem with the Green New Deal to show people how change is possible and how that change is deserved. So I think it's a case of picking your battles. You want to win people's hearts and minds and you've got to show them that things are possible. So you start with the things that you know are possible and can be done very quickly and build that confidence and take them on the path towards that utopian future that they should have been having all along. Amazing, thank you. And there's a question here from, just trying to get through, there's quite a few questions. Uh, Theodora Polenta, who actually we saw on our last panel, um, she's pretty good at questions. Uh, the, the Occupy Movement experimented with rejecting politics and trying to create a new society outside the structures of capitalism slash workplaces. What is the influence of Occupy's legacy within Labour? I assume you mean the Labour movement or are you talking about the Labour, Labour Party? I'm going to leave that ambiguous. Um, but let's start with Thea. Occupy, what's the, what's the influence of Occupy? Because you spoke about localism um, and obviously Occupy has both been criticized for its lack of let's say um scalable structural change um but at the same time it's obviously had a huge influence on activism ever since so i'll let you i'll let you unpack that yeah it's, it's interesting because i don't view occupy as like a localist movement except for the fact that like all movements it takes place in particular places right so like it occupies specific plazas and parks um but its demands and even if not concrete or something, or they were criticized for not being concrete enough, but there were actually like many demands and many interesting programmatic statements and also like collective identity articulations of which the late and, and recently passed David Graeber is, is partly responsible for the articulation of like the 99% as a new popular subjectivity. So it was incredibly generative. I would say it had maybe too many demands or too many identities rather than too few or wasn't concrete enough. I've never really understood that criticism, but um, rather than seeing it as something localist, what I see it is in the U.S., and this really relates to some of the things Kathy was saying about the sort of pedagogical and critical power of utopia, is that it like broke the hegemony. It, 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 it cracked it. It didn't break it down. It didn't dismantle it. It didn't last long enough to do so. And it didn't involve enough kind of key um, 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 sort of constituencies and social groups to do so. However, it cracked, it fractured something. Um, and it provided like a popular articulation and a left articulation of what the ruling class and its political allies were doing on um, post financial crisis, right? To sort of recover the economy in a way that just redounded to the benefit of the 1%. And I think it's like almost impossible to imagine like what the, the sort of increasing radicalization that's come in the past few years without Occupy sort of seizing a critical moment, radicalizing, shifting public consciousness, injecting class politics, really, like injecting like a language of class that had been actually repressed out of existence by the sort of state and capital's response to radical movements of the 60s and 30s, right? So like re-injecting a language of class, um, focusing on the invocation of, of political and economic inequality, the role of, of corporate influence um, and really paving the way for for several movements, for Bernie's campaigns, and also for, you know, not in a direct way, um, um, but but I think it's part of the trajectory of the sort of re-radicalization, revitalization of the labor movement in the US. I mean it's part of the trajectory. I don't want to say it's because of Occupy, but I think it's on it's like on that narrative arc that we might paint, um, where we've seen like the growth of of Wildcat and more militant strikes, especially among um uh folks in the public sector in, in the US. So I, I think we should be grateful for what it did and not critique it for what it didn't do. That's kind of my stance on Occupy. Yeah, I'm gonna, can I just add to that? Cause it's just, I, I agree entirely in, in another way, you know, another example of that is that I think it helped enable, um, you know, you sort of it reinvigorated class analysis. So it also enabled us to talk about capitalism um as a kind of legible system and once you start putting a, a large i mean so this is another way of thinking about how it wasn't just local because its effect was to get us to be able to think much more structurally and systematically and that opened up all kinds of possibilities for a number of different 
sort of economically oriented left projects. I mean, again, we could talk about this thing called capitalism as something that's legible, that we could even, you know, reference in some ways. Um, and I think that's another way to think about the, the lasting, you know, legacy of that, of that movement. Great, okay. I don't know if, uh, Becky, have you have anything to say on that or is that not, um, it's up to you, okay, no. Um, let's look here. I think there's, we've probably got a few, I mean, one or two more questions. Um, there's one question here, I think again from Alex Brent, which I think is, although, you know, this isn't a trade union panel, I think there's something, some of the conversations we've been having are, are relevant to trade unions insofar as unions are at the very forefront of these issues. So on the one hand, both the defense of, um, you know, workers, but at the same time, um, it's kind of their position at the moment to kind of put forward what the demands are in this crisis and going forward longer term, how do unions, you know, play a role in the transition from carbon intensive economies through to, um, there you go, there's a question there, uh, through, you know, the transition through from carbon intensive um, sectors and industries to um, green industries and green sectors. Um, so, of course, I guess this is something you argue with there in your book is that without um, the labor movement and that, you know, trade unions at the forefront of that, without that, then this change, um, you know, probably won't happen. Um, how does how does this conversation about utopias from the from the bold to the concrete? How does that um, reinforce the position of trade unions? I know in the UK we've also had you know a, a, an uptick an uptick in, in in membership. How does that reinforce the position of trade unions? And what position are they in now? And where 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 do you hope to see the trade union movement, movement go next? Um, maybe we start with Becky if she has a, a a comment on that, and then we'll see what the others. Have to say. Well, I think that's a really good question and uh, I think to what extent can the ideas be taken forward by unions if the Labour Party won't? Well the Labour Party is the trade union so I'd expect us to be working collaboratively in order to do that but of course that's not to say that we don't have disagreements over certain policies and the Green New Deal was one of them where there was a lot of concern and I completely understood where the concern came from particularly workers who were worried about a just transition and what we needed to do as a party was to exemplify that just transition. We'd already talked about certain kind of taxes on, you know, oil companies to start building a pot of money to provide a just transition to areas that would be adversely affected so that you could provide jobs guarantees in new industries. But we needed to go a little bit further, I think, and that's certainly what we've got to do over the next couple of years is to make sure that those who are affected do feel secure and that they are going to have that just transition. But in terms of the broader policies, I think the trade unions are a fantastic way to amplify what we're trying to say. We've got some fantastic trade unions who've been at the forefront of many of the radical policy agendas that we've had over the last few years. And sometimes when it's often been difficult for politicians to articulate, they've been able to campaign throughout their memberships to gain the support that we need to try and go out to sell those policies. But what we've got to do in return for that is to start selling trade unions. Every single member of the Labour Party should be a member of a trade union. And we need to go out into our communities and explain to people what trade unions actually are. Because unfortunately, I you know, joined a trade union because my dad was in a trade union. But many of my friends aren't in trade unions. They don't understand what the whole point of them is. And I think that's um, one of those things that's endemic in those people within my generation and those that came after. So we've got to reinvigorate that link and show that trade unions are essentially groups of people coming together in solidarity to demand a better life and a better world. That's what they're set up to do. That's what they've always been set up to do. And that's why they tie in very well to our utopian vision, if you like. I'm actually going to, we've got 12 minutes left. I'm actually going to pause that i'm not gonna let Thayer and kathy answer that question about trade unions just yet i know like i would, re would recommend Thayer ask reading Thayer's book actually on on the whole chapter on on um on the union movement we've got 12 minutes left so i want to actually have make sure there's time for um our speakers to answer this question which is basically there's two questions left but the first one is one utopian demand what is it now covid aside i want us to think you know there's the covid is the here and now we need to do x y and z um to to kind of meet uh you know this pandemic head on and the economic recession that we're going to that beyond that what's the what's the utopian demand that you'd like to see being tabled now that, it can range from the wildly provocative to the mildly estranging as use kathy's <laughs> um topography 
but what's the utopian demand you want to see on the table and this is the space where you want you are you are you know this is to be bold and to be big and you're not signing up to anything but i want to i want to hear at least what like one from each of you so let's start with fair what's your big utopian demand which would you want listeners to go away with and kind of chew over you're on mute you're on mute you're on mute sorry i'm sorry Sorry about that. Um, uh, okay, now I can speak again. Um, so my demand, which is constant with, with the sort of broad Green New Deal vision that I laid out is green social housing for all. Um, and by social housing, I think that term is familiar in the UK, though less so in the US a bit, though it's becoming more popularized. Um, but you know, I'm thinking of, 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 publicly, of public provision of housing, right? Um, and green, meaning that it's low carbon, it's energy efficient, it has gardens, it is beautiful, um, green in all of its wonderful senses. So that would be my demand. Um, I'm very inspired by the work of my um, co-author and collaborator, Daniel Aldana Cohen, who's done a lot around the Green New Deal for public housing um, in the US. Um, and I'm also inspired by an amazing sort of efflorescence of tenants' rights movements, partly who have done sort of defensive and mutual aid stuff around eviction, but who are also envisioning kind of uh, the guaranteed right to housing um, and the homes guarantee as, as a demand. So that that's my um, demand. Um, and I'm just going to say briefly why I've kind of already said a little bit about why I think it's a, it's a positive thing to fight for. But um, I think it connects to several things that we said in this conversation. Um, one in the jobs front, and again, not to wade into thorny debates over over green jobs versus UBI as sort of a ways to address the crisis, but I think it's it's interesting to think of building green housing and 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 revitalizing existing public housing as things that do create dignified and unionized jobs, um, and can sort of um, uh, stitch together a broader movement for the green new deal that includes like trade unions that have been a bit recalcitrant to put it diplomatically about sort of green new deal type politics. So that's one benefit. Another is that it would be a, a way to address this deep crisis of housing that we have in the U.S., the U.K., and, and a lot of the world, um, which is unaffordable housing, but it's also straight up homelessness. It's also um, the, the looming sort of crisis, and I want to put crisis in quotes, of climate migration. I don't see migration as a crisis. Um, uh, I don't see human movement as, as like a problem in and of itself. But we do need to think of ways to receive folks but that are moving displaced internally and externally, transnationally. So there's a lot of issues that I think affordable and free, you know, depending on the situation, green social housing would, um, would alleviate. But I also want to go to like some of Kathy's points about kind of like the deeper meaning of, of utopia as a kind of transformation and in individual and collective subjectivity, right? So, you know, when we think about housing, it's the place that we spend our time, right? Aside from work, right? And it's and it's the place that we either that either communities are built or people are isolated and alienated and fragmented, right? So we can think of like, you know, detached suburban housing as like key to creating like the neoliberal subject in the US. Whereas like dense and green and beautiful with green space and balconies and like social services right on site and childcare right there, like creates new forms of community, kind of has like a feminist sense of how to like redesign public space. Um, and also if you don't have to pay rent or if you pay much less rent, it also frees up like time because you don't have to like work all the time in order to pay rent and can free up time for political activism also made easier by the forms of community and neighborhoods that this type of housing approach might engender. So I think like housing is so multifaceted in, in what it can achieve. Um, and it is a great way to sort of focus on the visceral and the tangible um, in Green New Deal campaigning. Thank you. Okay, I, we actually haven't got time for my second question, but let's let's go to Kathy next and then we'll end with Becky. What's, what, Kathy, what's, Utopian demand you want to put on the table and and, and why? I'm so, like we have got about seven minutes between you and Becky, so I'm just a little, little slightly pressed for time. But. Okay, mine would be a guaranteed basic income in the form of a universal, unconditional, uh, living income paid as a wage to residents, not to citizens, but to residents. Um, and again, I I'm not defending this as a utopian vision. I mean, it's not. A basic income, even if we won it, would not replace the wage system, it would not replace the family system. So it's not in itself a utopia, but I do think that the 
you know, first of all, I think the benefits of it would be remarkable. I mean, I think it'd be tangible help to all of the unemployed, the precarious employed, the overworked, all of the people whose labor is now not remunerated with wages, including an enormous amount of caring labor that's done, socially necessary caring labor, without which this thing we know as the economy would not exist. So, I mean, there's super tangible benefits for it. But also, again, this, this process of demanding something like this requires us to recognize all the failures of the wage and family system and really to get us to ask some really important questions about how would we want to organize production and reproduction and the relationship between them? Is this institution of the family adequate as a way to house and manage and distribute all of the labor of care and social reproduction that we all need to do? Is the system of production at, at, at all, you know, the wage system, is it, is it, is it, is it, is there any way to organize it that would allow us also to engage in this social reproductive labor? So I think it's a way to also, again, going back to my claim about uh, utopian demands as perspectives and provocations, I think it's also a way to try to get us to sort of engage in some really important critical work um, about our contemporary conditions and to start thinking in much more dramatic and useful and imaginative ways about what might replace it. Okay, and Becky, I'm unfortunately giving you a slightly harder task as well. Is on the one hand, yes, what's you know what you take, what big demand, singular demand, you think is really important going forward, but also um, how do we make that accessible? And um, I think you know, as as the politician on on the panel, I think it's um, I think you'll be best placed to think about how do we drive that message home that this is not some pie in the sky. This is this is a demand that we should be asking for, and here you know, and here's why. So accessibility as well. Sorry to throw throw it off. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks. I'm rubbish at picking one thing because I always think socialism is like a big jigsaw, and if you have a few bits missing, then it looks rubbish. Um, but if I had to pick one, and I, I agree with Kathy and Thea's bits as well, so I'd have those bits, but I'll, I'll pick a different one. And I think the one that I'd pick is the Green New Deal. And obviously that's very big, so you probably want one specific part of the Green New Deal. But the specific part that I'd pick is democratic public ownership. And the reason for that, it's not because I love public ownership, and I do, trust me. It's because I know the power of democratising parts of our economy and the impact that that will have on a wider scale. So the example that I gave before by having publicly run energy companies uh, on our grid networks would mean that we'd have the infrastructure and we'd be able to drive the change and the investment at a faster pace than was already the case uh, at present. And we'd be able to make sure that profits were reinvested into the new infrastructure that we needed to see. When we created new public companies, we'd be able to take a majority stake and that would give us the power to make sure that all the workers were treated well, that trade unions were given access, that we were making sure that corporate responsibilities were as good as they possibly could be, that they were paying all the suppliers on time, that we were actually using local suppliers where possible to make sure that jobs were being created in that local area. So that public ownership gave us huge leverage uh, that should never be underestimated. And then what do we do as policymakers to sell that? Well, we've just got to make it a real story that people understand. And, you know, different things will resonate with different people. So if you're into the green movement, then talking about climate change and saving the earth, that'll float your boat. If you're in a deindustrialized community and perhaps, you know, looking at climate change, you know it's there, but you're more worried about putting food on your table. Maybe that kind of message won't resonate. And maybe something along the lines of jobs, 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 which is one of my favourite posters that I had in my office, would be something that we would use to try and sell that to you. But our job as policymakers has never been to react to what people want and try and tell them what we think they want to hear. It's for us to try and articulate our vision in a way that makes them want to believe in what we believe in. And we have struggled with that. I mean, you know, we haven't won the last general election for a start, so we need to recognise, aside from all the other issues that were present in that, and there were loads, one of the issues was not articulating what we believe in in a way sometimes that resonated with the people that it needed to resonate with. So we've got to have better messages and be able to, to tell those stories. And that, you know, lastly, the point of like, how do we do that? Because obviously, you know, 
we're not going to get onto the media anytime soon to talk about utopian socialism, are we? Let's be honest. Um, we've got to get out into our communities. We've got to find the people who feel precarious, who might be frightened of losing their jobs and say, look, don't put up with this. Join a trade union campaign. Campaign for your furlough to be extended. Campaign against redundancies at your workplace that don't need to happen. Campaign for the government to bail your company out. Campaign for a universal basic income if you can't put food on your children's table. Don't put up with it anymore because it doesn't need to be like this. Building that movement will give us the future we deserve. It won't be put off politicians like me, trust me. Everything we've ever fought for came because people fought and people came together in a movement to demand that that change happen. And this will be no different. It might seem hard, but we're going to get there in the end. Amazing. And on that note, we're going to end the panel. So we've gone from the bold to the concrete, to the bold to the concrete as well. Um, I should say before we go, I didn't flag this at the start, but we do, as with a few panels we've had at TWT, there's been a, a radio play. And we're going to have another one um, after uh, this session now. So uh, this year, arts workers at the TWT uh, Festival wanted to offer a more dramatic take on political education. Uh, we hope you stay for this particular reading of Life After Covid, which was created by Emily Collins. For this piece, Emily crowdsourced answers to the question, what do you want the future to look like? Very on topic. Our actors read the responses verbatim. The link is going to be posted in the chat, so check the chat out. And you can follow it to listen to Life After Covid on YouTube now. Uh, and final thing before we go, uh, last few announcements. Um, uh, there's there's still a fair few amount of TWT events coming up. So we've got this a final week. Um, I know uh, Charlie and Hope and all the others have been very busy at the back end, doing over a hundred events. So I think there's there's plenty more to come. So make sure you register for the festival to get to to check those out. And as I mentioned at the beginning, the World Transform relies on your support to continue their great work year round. 94 people have signed up. They still need plenty more. As I say, I'm a supporter at Autonomy. We, all, we, we I like to think we're all supporters. I need to check that. Um, please do uh, you know, become a supporter. It's, it's such an important organisation. Um, this is the final event that I'll be chairing, but I'll definitely be tuning in to the others. Um, I want to say thanks again to our panellists, Cathy, Rebecca and Thea, for offering us a whole variety of reflections on utopianism, both from the concrete demands through to the wider functions of why the left needs to be utopian. Um, I hope you'll check that play out and I'll see you soon. Thanks, guys. View the full TWT20 programme and become a supporter today to help us deliver political education all year round at theworldtransformed.org